Hello and welcome to the European Resilience Initiative Center video podcast. Today, our guest is Alex Melikashvili. He is a country risk expert with his focus on Caucasus and Central Asia. And he is currently in Tbilisi, Georgia, where mass protests erupted recently. Thank you that you have found time for this interview, Alex. Thank you for having me, Sergey. And uh, as I already said, uh, we have seen since several days protests in uh, Tbilisi. Um, people are obviously angry. What it is about? What is going on? Well, this is sort of a, a, a round two of the attempt by the ruling Georgian Dream Party to push through and adopt um, the legislation, um, which is a framework law on foreign agents. Um, this law is largely based on um, the Russian um, law. Um, and the Russian law, um, I would like to kind of remind your uh, uh, listeners, um, was adopted, if I recall correctly, uh, 20, in 2011 and led to essentially disintegration of the civil society in Russia. Um, so uh, Georgian Dream, the ruling party in Georgia, attempted to push this law um, in March of last year, but it encountered um, vigorous resistance from civil society, from youth, from students, um, from NGOs, from the op pro-Western opposition. There were protests on Rustaveli Avenue, just like what's happening right now, uh, because uh, people understand uh, that this law is extremely pernicious and it could uh, lead to um, essentially stifling of the civil society in Georgia, which is very vibrant um, and very active. Um, so it seems to me that the Georgian dream has not learned um, that lesson. And, and I'd like to backtrack and mention to you that um, as a result of this backlash in March, um, the ruling party withdrew this law, but now this year they resurrected it. And um, the only sort of uh, change um, in this law is the uh, wording referring to, they just basically took out the foreign agents and uh, uh, spelled it out a little bit more um, saying organizations um, pursuing uh, uh, or advancing foreign interests. That's the only cosmetic change. Compared and that to the is this, this law which you have mentioned, that is exactly what the Russians had uh, for years. And uh, we, we, we know now like the consequences of that in Russia. There is like absolutely no free speech law. People who have been brandmarked as foreign agents, practically if you have any uh, contact with any foreign person or foreign organization, including international ones, you must, uh, according to this Russian non-law, I cannot even call it a law, you must like uh, mark every of your public statement, including your postings on Instagram, Facebook, or other social networks, that you are a foreign agent, which sounds ridiculously. But this uh, development in Georgia, is it somehow connected to the upcoming elections in October this year? It's a good question. I mean, there are many theories about why Georgian Dream um, initiated it again, um, even though uh, it, in um, last year it led to um, destabilization of the uh, situation. So there are several views on this. Um, I mean, to address your question directly, uh, it's entirely counterproductive for the ruling Georgian Dream to pursue this because it will alienate a sizable chunk of the electorate ahead of the crucial parliamentary elections in October. Um, so it's entirely counterintuitive. Um, and um, there are several ways uh, to look at it. First of all, I'd like to um, you know, inform your audience that um, not too long ago, Kyrgyzstan successfully passed the same law on foreign agents. 
they adopted it and now it's the law of the land. Um, there was there were not much protests there. So in the same way, in the same you know manner, um, it is one of the explanations for why Georgian Dream is pursuing this has to do with the pressure um, from Russia, um, essentially. And I have to spell it out further to you because you know when you look at the, um, overall the situation in Georgia. Um, I mean, there is one figure who is considered to be uh, an informal ruler of the country, and that's a, a rather eccentric billionaire oligarch, um, philanthropist, Bidzina Ivanishvili. Um, and, you know, he returned to politics not too long ago, um, yet again, and became um, a chairman of the uh, ruling party, Georgian Dream. So, you know, one theory why they are pursuing this entirely counterproductive uh, uh, initiative, legislative initiative, is essentially um, because of the pressure from Russia, because Russia essentially wants to see its near abroad to be um, following in the footsteps of, of, of the um, neo-fascist uh, Putin's regime. And um, adopting this law is one of the prerequisites. Because what it does, as you mentioned yourself, is that, I mean, it stifles the civil society. So in the short term, this is very counterproductive for Georgian dream. However, in the medium term, if this law is adopted, it, pa it is passed and it is enforced, in the medium term, looking beyond the parliamentary elections. This is very positive for them because it will decimate the civil society. It will muzzle um, all the voices that are critical, highly critical of illiberal agenda of Georgian dream. Um, and, it, and this will in turn ensure the political survival of Georgian dream at the helm um, in, in Georgia for many years to come. And I have to also mention to all of your listeners and viewers that Georgian Dream has been um, a ruling party since the second half of 2012. So it's a quite number of years already. Um, and um, um, these coming uh, parliamentary elections are crucial because if they are voted out, they know um, that uh, it's highly likely that many key figures will be prosecuted. So they, the, for them, this is a, an existential struggle for political survival. But this is a question which I think we need to address uh, more precisely uh, to, to, to make like, the audience understand that um, I'm also not an expert in uh, the politics uh, in Georgia. And uh, please explain me this, uh, this situation with the Georgian dream and with uh, the Ivanisvili, who is a billionaire, who is famous for his love for uh, trees, like he collects <laughs> trees right. in his like Dendro parks, etc. It's a pretty eccentric man, as you have mentioned already. Uh, how many people stay in Georgia behind his party? And we are talking all the time that they are pro-Russian. Uh, what are the concrete examples of them being pro-Russian? I mean, probably the most visible one is the um, refusal by the Georgian Dream government to join the international sanctions imposed against Russia following the um, invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. That's the most visible um, sort of uh, um, aspect of their uh, political behavior, which makes um, observers think that they are de facto collaborationist government, essentially. Um, so that's probably the most visible because Georgian dream government refuses. Um, and the justification that it uses for not joining the international sanctions against Russia is 
um, framed in economic terms. So, you know, now former Prime Minister Garibashvili, but also other key members of the ruling Georgian Dream Party have been repeatedly saying that, look, um, you know, even if we join the sanctions against Russia, this will not have much of an impact on Russia per se, but it will have a detrimental impact on Georgian economy. So, um, as you may or may not be aware, Georgia has become one of the countries um, that uh, participates in what's called a, 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 a intermediate trade with Russia, um, whereby essentially many goods um, come to Georgia and then they are re-exported from Georgia and this in and of itself brings a lot of money to the country. Um, uh, they are re-exported uh, to other countries. In some cases, they are re-exported to Armenia and Armenia is being a member of Eurasian Economic Union, has, it, has a, 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 a very special arrangement with Russia. So for example, one of the examples would be um, cars that are brought to Georgia um, and then re-exported to Armenia. And then from Armenia, they make their way back to Russia. Uh, because as you uh, can surmise, Russia is currently under severe trade restrictions. And I'm not necessarily talking about sanctioned items or dual use items, such as microchips and things like that. I'm talking about other things because um, truth be told, uh, Russia is sort of uh, uh, trapped in the concentric circles of uh, trade restrictions. Um, and all these countries, and by the way, Georgia is not the only culprit in all that. You know, Kyrgyzstan is the same. Um, Central Asian countries, um, Kazakhstan is the same. So you have, if you observe the trade dynamics between Georgia and Russia, between Georgia, between Kyrgyzstan and Russia, you will see anomalous spikes spikes in um, export from these countries to Russia, which was never the case before. And it began in 2022 and it continued in 2023. And now it, this trend continues. These anomalous spikes related to re-export of various goods um, you know, from these countries that form what uh, uh, Kremlin calls it's near abroad. Um, Indeed, so, and we, we have seen that the spikes for certain goods, they are tenfold or thirtyfold for certain goods like washing machines, uh, if I'm not mistaken, to Armenia, the spike is something like 1000 fold, like from right. several, several pieces of washing machines being brought from uh, Europe to, to Armenia two years ago, and now there are thousands of them. And most probably the Russians uh, just buy them to get like some pieces of equipment, not the wash machine itself, but the piece of equipment, first of all, electronics. But in contrary to, uh, to Georgia, these countries which you mentioned, Armenia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, they are uh, members of the so-called Eurasian Economic Union and Russian troops have not occupied parts of their territory. But Georgia is neither a member of the Eurasian Economic Union nor a military ally of Russia, quite the opposite. 20% uh, or than 20% of Georgian territory is being occupied by Russia. And still, why does the Georgian government treat Russia so friendly? It is counterintuitive. Yes, which is why um, the political behavior of the ruling party uh, can be described as uh, Russia friendly. That's precisely why. So not joining the sanctions, participating in the um, intermediate trade, which essentially supports um, Russia's Russian government's um, uh, what's called a parallel import policy, which is essentially intended to um, avoid the trade restrictions, uh, including avoiding sanctions on items uh, that are not allowed. For example, um, certain categories of microchips, uh, um, electric, cir electric circuitry, um, and other goods that are sanctioned and dual use, dual use items. Um, 
you know, again, Georgia is not unique to this. You're right to to point out the sort of uh, glaring discrepancy because again, um, you know, constitution of Georgia obliges any government in power to make steps towards integration into European Union and NATO. That's a constitutionally enshrined provision. Yet the Georgian government at present does um, take steps that uh, call into question um, its orientation. And this law, returning back to the law on foreign agents, this law is something that has been heavily criticized. Um, you know, I mean, EU, NATO, um, individual European member states, Germany, um, France, they all warned the government that doing this will be um, detrimental to Georgia's aspirations to uh, proceed with accession to the European Union. And I have to also mention that late last year, um, Georgia received a candidate status for the EU accession. However, this candidate st status is heavily caveated by nine policy priorities mandated by EU, which the Georgian government has to fulfill to, to retain that status. And the EU, um, United States, just recently, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, um, Western countries in general, they made it clear, very clear, EU representation in Georgia made it clear that this particular law will be undermining Georgia's commitments to one of the nine policy priorities that are necessary for the government to fulfill in order to retain the candidate status. So in other words, candidate status that was granted to Georgia last year is unlike the candidate status that Moldova received or Ukraine received because Georgia's candidate status is conditional on these nine policy priorities. And this law goes against one of the policy priorities. And besides this law, and because it goes against one of the policy priorities mandated by EU, it sabotages Georgia's EU accession. And as such, this law is actually um, not constitutional. Because I mentioned to you that uh, one of the provisions in the constitution obliges any government in power to pursue Euro-Atlantic integration. This law sabotages this process. Therefore, it is anti is not constitutional. That is indeed a, a huge problem with the uh, with this law. Not only the moral aspect, but as you mentioned, the um, the status, the anti-constitutional status. But uh, there are another um, aspect. There is another aspect of uh, Georgian-Russian relations, if you allow me to put it that way, starting from the uh, from the full-scale invasion of Russia against Ukraine. Dozens and dozens of thousands of Russian citizens moved to Georgia, mostly to Tbilisi, but not only. Um, we have heard that there were, like in the beginning, some concerns that the number of the Russian citizens in Georgia will uh, reach the level when they will form some sort of additional political uh, political force, or at least will impact the the, the policy or economy. Uh, how does it look like now with all these Russian citizens? Uh, are they still there or do they go back to Russia? They're still there, though, you know, the thing is, um, I'm at present unable to give you specific figures because Georgian Interior Ministry is very um, reluctant to release figures about the presence of Russian citizens in Georgia. But you are absolutely correct. Um, there were two distinct waves um, of uh, uh, Russian citizens who fled to Georgia. One wave, um, you know, shall we call it a smart wave, um, followed um, the February 2022 invasion. Um, there were not that many, 
but there were uh, quite a number still. Um, and these were typically wealthier Russians and um, they came and uh, um, um, opened the hundreds of businesses. Um, many are IT uh, specialists. They work remotely. Um, they bought uh, real estate um, and um, um, and yeah, they took advantage of the fact that Georgia has a unique, um, actually of all countries in the world, law pertaining to the Russian citizens, allowing them to stay um, in the country visa-free for up to a year. And then there is a technicality whereby um, a person can leave to say neighboring Armenia or any other country for a few days and then come back and this, this clock starts again so to speak. So um, that's a unique feature. And I, I'm not aware of any other country in the world that would have such sort of, you know, friendly um, visa-free policy towards Russian citizens. Um, so, um, so that was the first wave th that followed uh, February 2022 invasion of Ukraine. And then there was another one later that year when um, as uh, you recall, uh, as uh, uh, um, President Putin announced partial mobilization, that was September. Um, and and people that followed that partial mobilization, they were less wealthy, um, and there were even bigger wave, and many were streaming into the country via the uh, uh, land border. Um, the only land border crossing in Upper Lars. Um, um, and uh, just to address your question, I mean, my understanding is, and this was reported in open sources, that due to, um, shouldn't say hostile, but unfriendly overall um, um, environment towards Russians, in Georgia, many of these draft dodgers um, parted. So many left. We don't have the exact numbers. The only figure that I can give you um, off the top of my head was uh, uh, released uh, uh, by Interior Ministry um, a while back, um, and it's not recent. And at the time, it was, uh, uh, um, if I recall correctly, again, something on the order of about 130,000. Um, but that's the only figure that we have. And it's, again, it's old. Um, so late last year and this year, there, there, there were reports in open sources indicating that many um, Russians, uh, due to overall unfriendly atmosphere in the country towards them, um, uh, left. And many went to Serbia, where, where the overall... Uh, environment and atmosphere is friendlier towards Russians than it is uh, than it is in Georgia. Um, so, but uh, you know, I mean, there uh, the influx of Russians led to a number of different sort of cascading consequences, including, for example, a sharp increase in 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 uh, in rental um, in major cities. Because as you correctly pointed out, uh, most of these Russians settled um, in essentially two cities, really, Tbilisi and Batumi. Um, th there are not that many uh, who are scattered elsewhere, but mostly they're concentrated in, 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 two, in two major cities, that's Batumi and Tbilisi. So. And uh, that is, of course, uh, in the, uh, that has, of course, impacted the uh, market in the both uh, cities. And as you mentioned, Absolutely. there have been tensions between the uh, uh, Georgian uh, citizens and the Russians, also because of the language issue and uh, uh, other things and the support for Ukraine from Georgians, which uh, um, was not uh, pretty understandable for several Russians, as we could read in the news. But uh, as you said, you, like there are no there are no concrete numbers which describe the situation now. But what I wanted to ask you in relations to this situation on the relations between uh, Georgia and, uh, and uh, Russia and the whole like military situation, the whole 
Russia's war against Ukraine has impacted the region massively and the war in the Black Sea and uh, the uh, stop practically stop of the uh, trade through the Black Sea uh, as there is a danger of uh, sea mines and uh, shelling and missile attacks. But now Russia is trying to create a new naval base on the sovereign territory of Georgia and in particular in uh, Russia occupied Abkhazia, which is a north uh, western part of Georgia. Uh, what is the situation there and um, how does it impact the whole uh, situation, security station on the Black Sea? I mean, Abkhazia has been um, off limits for the Georgian government for, for a while. Um, there is um, Russian military presence there, and the Georgian government, as a matter of policy, um, adopted approach that rules out the use of force to resolve this territorial conflict. Um, as a result, um, there is a hands-off approach, and there is not much that the Georgian authorities can do to prevent, derail, or stall even the ongoing construction of a naval base uh, um, uh, near Ochamchire um, in Abkhazia. So um, the, my understanding is the construction is ongoing. There are many sort of technicalities related to that uh, location that uh, uh, imply that this project will take some time, um, though um, uh, Russians are motivated because Ukrainians very successfully essentially uh, pushed them out from that part of the Black Sea, um, prompting the Russians to seek alternative alternatives, including in Abkhazia. But that in and of itself, um, again, is a work in progress, and it will not resolve the immediate um, needs of uh, uh, um, um, in terms of docking the vessels. So, um, and as Ukrainians are increasingly demonstrating by their naval uh, drone capabilities, um, um, you know, no space is essentially safe um, from the attacks. And actually, it's my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Ukrainian authorities, as a matter of fact, said that uh, uh, um, you know uh, any type of naval facilities in Abkhazia will be fair game for them in terms of targeting. Um, so that's the situation as of now. Again, Georgian government cannot do much, can do at all anything, in fact, um, to stop the uh, uh, ongoing construction. There are many technical issues related to um, uh, building a, 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 an appropriate port facility um, along that coastline due to the fact that you need a lot of dredging, you need a lot of um, works to um, essentially make uh, uh, sizable vessels enter because uh, the uh, sort of uh, a, 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 hydrological aspects of this is such, given the um, natural kind of landscape there, um, that would require a lot of work. And actually, as a matter of fact, the Russians have been saying that they they wanted to build a, a proper naval facility near Chamchira for a really long time. And, you know, um, not much has been happening. Now they are incentivized because of the um, push from the Ukrainians that uh, resulted in essentially a significant number of vessels being destroyed belonging to the Black Sea fleet, Russia's Black Sea fleet. So now they have an urgent need to build one. But again, this will take some time. This will take at least several years, at least several years. So um, it's a work in progress and, and the outcome is not clear. Um, and again, Ukrainians have proved time and again that they have a reach uh, far and beyond I mean, in all of this, Sergei, one of the interesting things is uh, the seaport of Novorossiysk. It's a really interesting uh, 
And for, very, those who, for those who listen, yeah. Oslo overseas is located on the sovereign Russia's territory, a bit yes. further to uh, northwest from a Russia occupied Georgian uh, territory of Abkhazia. You're absolutely correct. Port of Novorossiysk is a key point, for, one of the key points for um, Russian um, exports of oil. Um, but it's even more important as a gateway for Kazakhstan's exports of oil. More than two thirds of um, Kazakhstan's oil exports go via, via Novorossiysk. So that's a sort of a key bottleneck for Kazakhstan. Um, and um, you know, I'm not the only one who, who's been saying this, uh, a, a number of other analysts and experts have been saying the same thing that if you look at the pattern of Ukrainian attacks against the um, um, Russian oil refineries, you definitely notice that Novorossiysk is somehow absent from target selection. And in my view, um, there is a very logical explanation for that. And that has to do with Ukrainian restraint. Ukrainians are restraining with regard to targeting major Russian oil export facilities. They have been targeting successfully refineries, but when it comes to these key bottlenecks, and there are not that many of them, actually, um, but Novorossiysk is definitely one of them. Um, they've been, um, well, I, I'm not aware of major attacks against Novorossiysk. There were some, but none that would target the Kasp Caspian Pipeline Consortium. Caspian Pipeline Consortium, for, for your listeners and viewers, is the pipeline that pumps uh, more than two thirds of Kazakhstan's oil exports via Novorossiysk and then there are offshore terminals that offload it to tankers. So it's a peculiar omission on the part of uh, Ukrainians to not target Novorossiysk. Again, in my view, this has to do with restraint. Now, there are many reasons why Ukrainians would restrain themselves with regard to Novorossiysk. And I would like to think, and that's my speculative conjecture, is that Ukraine doesn't have the intention to hurt Kazakhstan uh, because by targeting uh, uh, CPC and tar targeting CPC terminal in Novorossiysk, that would definitely hurt Kazakhstan. And I don't think that President Zelensky um, is too keen on, on, on doing that. So. Of course, and Kazakhstan is uh, not a part in this war. And uh, we have uh, also seen the uh, criticism from the US uh, after Ukraine has targeted Russia's oil refineries, and that was enough for pretty harsh criticism. I can imagine how unhappy people can be uh, if Ukraine targets uh, or starts targeting Novorossiysk with, as you said, two thirds of oil export of Kazakhstan. That would have much more uh, immense impact on the world energy market than in Russia's refineries, as Russia doesn't export almost any of its gasoline uh, or other products uh, to the world market. So these refineries are mostly for the internal market. But as you have mentioned already, other countries like Armenia, for example, um, what is the situation there? We have seen a very interesting drift uh, by uh, Armenia's Prime Minister, Nikol Pashinyan, who has expressed recently his wish that his country joins the European Union. And before he has allowed himself like several steps which were absolutely unexpected from him, even like a couple of years ago, criticizing Russia's foreign policy and demanding more true sovereignty of Armenia against Russia. Uh, how do you evaluate this development? Armenia is currently in a very difficult predicament because. Prime Minister Pashinyan definitely wants to, how should I say, um, a weakened Russian grip on that country. Um, and uh, 
he wants to do this um, in such a manner so as not to jeopardize Armenian security. Which is... And what is what is Russia's grip uh, on Armenia? We know there is a uh, military base in Gyumri, uh, which is pretty pretty uh, numerous presence of Russia's troops. But what else? Well, I mean, one of the interesting recent initiatives has been the demand on the part of the Armenian government to um, essentially end the deployment of Russian border guards at the country's most important um, airport, Zvartnots, as uh, viewers near Yerevan. Um, so that's number one airport in the country. That's an international airport. And as your viewers and listeners may or may not be aware, um, Russian border guards are deployed there and have been deployed there based on the bilateral agreement for a while now. So as of late, Armenian authorities have been um, making statements indicated the, indicating that they want Russian border guards to leave. Moreover, so, wait, mo wait. Let me let me let me make it clear. Uh, if I understood it clearly, so the the Russian border service officers were stationed in the airport of sovereign country Armenia. Correct. Uh, checking papers of people Correct. entering Armenia. Correct. Yes, there are two tiers there. So two tiers there. So you have Armenian border guards and you have Russian border guards and they jointly carry out, you know, at the port of entry in Zvartnots. But that's not, not the only example um, of uh, um, um, Russian sort of uh, uh, hard influence in the country. Um, Armenia's borders with Turkey and Iran are jointly patrolled by Russian border guards and Armenian border guards. So that's another example of essentially Armenian sovereignty being uh, uh, truncated or being uh, eclipsed by the Russian um, military presence. Now, all of these uh, deployments are subject to bilateral agreements. Um, and it is, um, you know, for example, Gyumri military base is subject to a bilateral agreement um, that specifies um, certain uh, sort of rights um, on the part of the host country. And the host country can withdraw from this agreement. But, um, um, and that's where you have this difficult predicament uh, of Armenia has to do with the fact that, well, in right now, um, officially Erdogan is seeking external security guarantees that would um, allow them to um, essentially uh, depart from the Russian sphere of privileged interests. This is a very difficult um, and complex endeavor um, and fraught with a lot of risks for Armenia and specifically for government of Prime Minister Pashinyan. Um, I mean, I, I have to also mention, and pardon me for going on several tangents here, but I also have to mention that um, Armenian government, um, without specifying what it means precisely, mentioned that it froze its participation in the collective security treaty organization. And uh, Armenian uh, authorities have plenty of reasons for doing so. Moreover, um, Armenia welcomed the European Union monitoring mission, which has been deployed um, in Armenia for some time now. Um, and this unarmed mission, um, it has an abbreviation of EU, uh, EUMA, European Union Monitoring Mission in Armenia. They are unarmed, but they are eyes and ears of European Union along the border with Azerbaijan. That's very important because they essentially um, monitor the situation and report if there are any, um, any cross-border incidents, shootouts, 
as is the case almost uh, uh, on a regular basis with, 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 with certain intervals. So in other words, this step two, the deployment of the European Union monitoring mission is something that obviously didn't please Russia. Russia criticized it. Russia continues to criticize this. So all these small steps of defiance on the part of Armenia um, form the picture uh, which you outlined, which is that essentially Pashinyan is attempting, trying to weaken the Russian grip over Armenia. And um, this is not an easy task, given the fact that Armenia um, has a history of uh, military defeat with Azerbaijan over Nagorno-Karabakh. And then last year, we witnessed how Azerbaijan essentially, in a matter of few days, um, regained control over Nagorno-Karabakh, generating more than 100,000 refugees. So there are all of those issues um, you know, represent the sort of layer cake of, of problems that Pashinyan has to deal with. But, you know, um, at the same time, European Union's involvement in, in Caucasus is unprecedented. There was never, never before um, to this degree. And earlier this month, European Union um, unveiled a, a fairly sizable financial package for Armenia, um, which is intended to strengthen its resilience. Um, the idea is to um, help Armenian authorities with all these problems, um, but also to strengthen the civil society there. Um, and um, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here because uh, yeah, I don't want, I don't want to uh, uh, usurp your, your time. But you have already mentioned uh, um, this uh, this situation, this conflict, uh, war uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan, uh, which lasts like not for the first even decade. Last year there was uh, the next uh, escalation of this war, and uh, Azerbaijan regained control over part of its sovereign territory for a longer time. Uh, which was not under control of Azerbaijan, Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, how much of potential for more escalation is here uh, on other parts of Azerbaijani-Armenian border? And what is the role of Russia here? Because Russia always tried to present itself as a guardian of Armenia. You have already mentioned joint patrolling of the border and Russian military base. But some experts said that Russia actually has its vital interest to keep the tensions between Armenia and Azerbaijan on a certain level to uh, let Armenia uh, be vulnerable and dependent on Russia's assistance. Well, there is uh, definitely some truth to um, depicting the picture in this manner. I mean, let's backtrack a bit. Um, you know, Pashinyan came to power in 2018. He came to power from the street. He came to power as a result of the nationwide peaceful civil disobedience campaign that picked out corrupt um, pro-Russian um, Armenian government from power. So anyone who comes from the street into the um, into power is automatically suspect by Kremlin. Um, so there is not much love lost between them. So one can interpret all these events that transpired since 2018 in Armenia and in Nagorno-Karabakh as Russia's attempt to punish Pashinyan. However, there are fundamental facts on the ground. For example, Yumri military base is there. Um, there is a military air base near Yerevan. It's there. You have joint patrols of the border. Um, so all of these factors are there. And Armenian government um, has not expressed any desire to uh, withdraw from those treaties. At the same time, to make this picture more complicated for you, <laughs> uh, you have 
after Azerbaijan regains control over Nagorno-Karabakh, um, essentially you have a two-track peace negotiations between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Two track because one track is under the aegis of Russia, and another track is under joint um, sort of uh, uh, joint. How should I say it? joint management of the EU and US. So far, um, these peace uh, uh, talks produced little tangible results. Though, if you pay attention to official statements of both sides. Um, they are blowing hot and cold, so to speak. Sometimes they say that um, the framework peace agreement is within reach. Sometimes they say otherwise. But you have a negotiations process ongoing on a peace agreement that would once and for all resolve the use of force between the two countries. There are quite a number of technicalities um, related to this process, including border delimitation, um, which is problematic for a number of technical reasons, including the difference uh, between the references that are used by one side and another. I'm referring to Soviet era territorial administrative uh, maps providing for the division between the two countries. That's a complicated process. Um, they have a bilateral working group between the two countries that is supposed to um, carry out negotiations, technical negotiations related to um, border delimitation and, and demarcation. Um, so that's where we are. Um, in addition to this, um, Azerbaijan, Azerbaijani government uh, claimed um, that there are several settlements uh, that are currently under Armenian control that should be returned to Azerbaijan. We're talking about a number of villages. Um, um, and along all, along all of these processes, along, along these negotiations, you have intermittent uh, cross-border fire exchanges. Most recently, uh, uh, there was one um, just earlier this, this month. So, and sometimes these uh, cross-border fire exchanges result in casualties. Now, to kind of um, address uh, um, what I thought in your question was the possibility of a larger conflict. Um, just superficially, uh, Azerbaijan is, in my view, unlikely to start anything major uh, because it is hosting uh, in November, if I recall correctly, COP29. COP29 being a major, for those who don't know, being a major um, climate um, and environmental UN uh, um, international forum with participations of uh, tens of thousands of uh, 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 foreign dignitaries and NGOs, environmentalists, and so forth. Um, if uh, uh, if we recall, last year it was ho hosted by United Arab Emirates, and this year it is hosted by Azerbaijan. So, in my view, that's a marker that makes um, um, uh, it's less likely that Azerbaijan would under, you know, would would under undertake some sort of a major um escalation that that you refer to um and then there is another aspect so i mentioned the cop29 as one of the um mitigating factors and then there is even a larger factor you see it's one thing to do a border skirmish it's one thing to occupy a sliver of unpopulated rugged terrain along the border which azerbaijan did by the way um, in Armenia. But it's another matter if Azerbaijan marches in to Armenia um, in a full-scale military invasion of Armenia proper. And the reason why I mention this is because that, in my view, 
would trigger Russian red line. Russia has bilateral commitments to defend Armenia from any military attack. Um, so an outright full-scale invasion of Armenia will trigger these commitments. And if Russia doesn't do anything at all, well, that would be a unilateral abrogation of these framework agreements that oblige Russia to defend Armenia. And that would call into question the entire bilateral security arrangement between the two countries. Um, and that would be, in my view, last straw for official Yerevan, prompting Yerevan to withdraw from them. Because then what would be the benefit of having Russian troops on, on your territory if they don't defend you from an outright military invasion? I mean, these are all logical questions that I don't think one has to be a, even a military analyst or expert at all you know, to, to ask them. Um, um, and uh, for Azerbaijan, that's a mitigating factor because Azerbaijan certainly doesn't want to enter into an outright military confrontation with Russia. That's definitely not in Azerbaijan's interest. Um, now, you know, it's not for me to tell you that there are, you know, plenty of conspiracy theories surrounding the potential scenarios. And, you know, according to some of them, you know, uh, uh, a, a, a potential invasion of Armenia would be preceded by a, a, essentially an agreement between Russia and Azerbaijan, agreeing that, look, you know, Azerbaijan would enter, but Russia would not do anything. But again, you know, I'm drawing your attention to sort of facts on the ground. There are bilateral security and defense commitments. And if um, Russian troops deployed in Armenia do nothing, as the Rus Russian peacekeepers did when Azerbaijan marched into, marched into Nagorno-Karabakh, that's a completely different ballgame. Because that goes into question the fundamental framework agreements between the two countries that again oblige Russia to 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 step in and defend Armenia from any military attack from any country. So yeah, I don't know if I exactly answered your question, but yes, uh, it is a very complicated situation on to all. Thank you for all this uh, insight. I would gladly continue this uh, talk, but uh, I'm afraid uh, uh, it is already too late in uh, Tbilisi. Thank you so much for this conversation. It was Alex Velikasrili, who is a country risk expert focusing on uh, countries of Caucasus and Central Asia. And he's currently in Tbilisi, Georgia, where we have uh, mass protests uh, of the people of Georgia against the pro-Russian government of uh, mid-party Georgian dream, led by an oligarch, uh, Vizina Ivanishvili. And we have tried to get more insight what is going on in Georgia, but not only, also in the neighboring countries and in the whole region. Thank you so much, Alex, and take care. Thank you for having me. Take care, Sergei. And don't forget to like, to share, subscribe to this channel and wait for the next interview.